My name is Nicola Persico, and I'm the academic director of Kellogg's Public Private Initiative. My job now is to introduce Sarah Murray here, uh, who is going to moderate the panel. Uh, Sarah is a journalist and feature writer who uh, specializes in the relationship uh, between business, society, and the environment. Uh, she also writes uh, research reports uh, on business and sustainability for the Economist Group. Sarah's work has appeared in publications including New York Times, The Wall Street Journal, Forbes, and The Economist. Uh, she is the author of several books, uh, including Movable Feasts, The Incredible Journeys of the Food We Eat. Uh, and this book was selected as one of the best book uh, in J.P. Morgan's private bank's 10 summer must-read books. Sarah is born in the UK and has lived in London, in Hong Kong, in Hanoi, where she helped launch the Vietnam Economic Times, and in South Africa. She is now based in New York City. And so without further ado, thank you, Sarah. Thank you very much. Chicago. It's the first time I've ever been here, so I'm very excited. And um, and as as you mentioned, I, I've been covering this for for many many years now. So it's really interesting to see the the debate evolve as, as we go along. Um, I'm actually just going to do the briefest of introductions here, and then I think we're just going to I'm going to maybe sort of move around a bit, and uh, we'll just make this a conversation with the panelists rather than anybody doing uh, any presentations. So we have uh, three wonderful faculty here. And um, we have Susan Robinson, who <laughs> I have to, I'm just going to say, from one of the companies that I, I love your company because the name is called Waste Management, and that is exactly what it does. <laughs> <laughs> and I mean, I've watched so many companies. I mean, in the UK, British Steel became Chorus. I mean, like, what does that mean? You know, <laughs> what was wrong with British Steel? So I have to say, I really like Waste Management, but you, you know what you do. <laughs> and. Um, <laughs> And then I'm just going to very briefly mention um, the publication. Because I am an author myself, I know the importance of having your publications named. And it's always good to get them out there. And I think it, it helps put, put our panelists into context. So, um, so Harry Kramer, who was also um, CEO and chairman of Baxter International, has written the four, principle of, sorry, the four principles of values-based leadership. Um, Daniel Diemeyer has written Reputation Rules, Strategies for Building Your Company's Most Valuable Asset. And Braden has written many papers around um, social movements, conflict, and, and, and change. Um, so I, I thought I'd just start, because we're talking about uh, corporate activism and the power this has on companies. Um, it was just a little anecdote that I, I uh, the other day I was, I was at my doctor's, this was actually about a year ago, but maybe not, you know, quite recently. And I was explaining about what I write about for the Financial Times. And I said, well, you know, I write about companies' relationship to business and so, to society and the environment. And she said, what's that? And I said, well, you know, I cover, for example, sweatshop issues, uh, you know, how companies are managing their labor supply chains in developing countries. And she said, oh, she said, I, tr I absolutely try and do the right thing. And I said, oh, really? And she said, oh, I never buy products from Nike. <laughs> And I said, well, you might want to rethink that policy because, you know, Nike has since, um, you know, now seen as one of the sort of leaders in this, in this area and uh, has all kind of very interesting programs to, to improve their management of, of uh, labor supply chains. But it just, to me, um, summed up how powerful these things are and how, you know, since when was it? I mean, the early 90s, you know that has stuck with the company and you do not want to have that um you know on, on your on your brand um one thinks also of um nestle well i mean i've been the things i've been writing about nestle and looking now at its sort of shared value programs they've got some very interesting initiatives with um with sort of uh, smallholder farmers in their supply chains in in um, africa they've got very um interesting water conservation policies but you know if you talk to anybody they'll say to you, how to milk in the developing world. And so, you know, those, those kinds of, um, those kinds of, you know, the branding issues sort of really stick. And I think the other thing that, you know, we might talk a little bit about here is, is how this has shifted as well. Because, you know, we, we had a lot of talk at lunch about this absolutely, you know, dramatic decade of change. And one of the things that I've been watching is, is 
partly, you know, you see this through the activist world. I mean, there was the time in the sort of good old, bad old days when it was governments that you, you campaigned against. And uh, clearly, you know, the Arab Spring shows us that that hasn't, hasn't ended. But, you know, the, the rise of the corporation, the rise of the brand, and by the way, the rise of, you know, social media and the ability for people to express these uh, dissent against corporations has really dramatically changed the picture. Um, however, from there, we've sort of gone on to a world where, um, you know, former foes are, are making friends as well. So that, I think that's something we might discuss on, you know, to, to the extent to which, um, you know, companies have um, enlisted NGOs for their sustainability programs, because that's uh, that's something that's that, that, you know happening quite a lot now. You see, you know, most NGOs in the world have um, business facing, um, you know, organizations or units or whatever which are were actually you know doing doing work with companies I, I i remember seeing this 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 sort of started to happen in the i can't remember when i had this conversation but it was you know, it was probably a decade ago with um a guy from greenpeace in the uk and he talked about their relationship with unilever and they'd started very early on for, for a, an NGO working with Unilever on, um, I think it was the CFCs in their refrigeration <laughs> units. And he said, you know, and I said, well, listen, you're a, you're a campaigning organization. Um, how does this sit with what you do? And, um, and he said, well, um, we have a difficult balance to strike because our membership thinks that we hate companies and you know we have to fight them and do everything we can. But I came to this realization many years ago that actually, we can work with companies we're going to you know if you can change the path of a company like size of unilever you can have a much bigger act uh, impact than if you're actually um you know uh, campaigning against them but the great thing about huge companies one of the good things about this is that we can be he said we can be working with them on this particular issue in one of their business units but they're so big we can be campaigning against them in, for something that they're doing in India, you know, miles away. So we can keep that interesting dance going. And I think the very interesting thing about that dance as well, and I think a, you know, a company like Unilever sort of understands this, is that um, you need that activist edge. So it's actually good for the company if they're still being campaigned against in certain things, because if Greenpeace suddenly became a corporate work walkover and started becoming, you know, being a consultant to companies, you know, where would the kudos for Unilever be from working with with a, a very activist um, organisation? So it's, it, you know, it's something that is, um, it, it's a balance to strike, and um, and I think that um, not all companies understand that, and I think we'd like, to, I'd like to ask the panel a little, little bit about how they see different sectors, different companies reacting to, um, to activism, you know, do they, do they resist it? Do they just ignore it? Do they work with them? You know, what, what are the different ways of doing this? Um, and then, and then look at that sort of changing relationship. Um, and then, and then the third thing I think we, we want to talk a bit about is, is how does this actually impact the company, uh, its valuation, its perception, those sorts of things. Um, another little anecdote, which involves Nike was that I was talking to, um, somebody from Nike many years ago when they were still sort of in the throes of, of dealing with this sweatshop issue. And, and, um, and they said, well, actually, you know, share price and, and sales, we haven't been dented too much, but we, what, one thing that's really hampered us is that we can't hire top people anymore. People, the people we really want while this has been going on doesn't, uh, you know, don't want to work for us. And so, you know, there's a very big business impact that, that maybe, you know, really does affect companies with talent management. So, um, so I'd just like to, so I'm going to open it up now and um, feel free, whichever of you would like to chime in first. How have you seen the relationship between um, court, you know, activists and companies change, say, in the past decade? I'll jump in first. Um, so actually, I gave a presentation about this a week ago, and we didn't bring our presentations with us, but... Um, <laughs> In that presentation, I have a slide where you can sort of look at the words associations that have, uh, if you look at the Google Ngram charts, and you can see that there's a, almost a simultaneous increase of the use of the term social activism and the use of the term corporate social responsibility. And they both have really peaked in the last 20 years. Now, there are lots of reasons, you know, I'm not saying that one has necessarily caused the other, but they're somewhat connected. Social activism, 
was not really a term that people used, uh, you know, in the 40s or the 50s like they do today. Um, it wasn't sort of a, a am amateur occupation that, that people uh, take on, or even uh, certainly not a professional occupation for um, NG among people who work for NGOs. But it has become a very common um, um, role that uh, people take, and it's had a huge influence on the way the government operates. And increasingly, it's had um, had a, played a huge role in the thing in the way that corporations have evolved. CSR, um, corporate social responsibility, um, even though it's a term that has sort of you know been used off and on, you know, dating back to the um, or certainly the practices have been used since dating back to the 19th century. It hasn't become a popular term really until the la until the 1980s. And it's because it's also become a vocation. Right? There are now CSR specialists. People, they, they, all they do in, in companies is think of new ways to do pro-social things. And this has partly been uh, a reflection of this evolving relationship between activists representing society um, and, and who, are, who are articulating grievances about um, the way that companies operate. And then companies responding by saying, no, we're not as bad as you think we are. You know, we actually do a lot of good things, and they're trying to defend their images um, and their reputations uh, by by you know engaging in more and more socially responsible looking things. So I think there's a there's certainly a partial correlation between the, the two over time. Yeah. So well, I want to follow up here on that, but um, um, you know, kind of give you my perspective. So I've been kind of um, observing this field, I would say, over the last, almost the last 20 years. And um, um, if you had to draw a curve or a line on like the importance of NGO as an activist, I would say it's kind of has been gradually increasing and then it fast increasing. And then there was a dip uh, about 2008, 2009. Then that's when we had the financial crisis and people were preoccupied with other stuff. But then it's kind of now we're back to basically that trajectory. And um, the reason why this is important, I think that particularly when you come from the corporate world, and I, I, I remember these conversations very well from 15, 16 years ago, there was a strong sense that this was a fad, right? It's something that kind of comes, maybe kind of like a luxury item or something that comes and goes, uh, and we just kind of have to wait this out. And I don't think that's the case. And I think the, uh, the last kind of uh, 20 years or two decades really have, have demonstrated that. So what are the underlying reasons for an increase in social activism and, as Braden has pointed out, the corresponding corporate response that we call by different names, sometimes CSR, sometimes sustainability, uh, sometimes um, um, other, other terms are used for that, but it's all about the same thing. It's responding or anticipating proactively dealing with those changes. So I would say there are, there are a couple of factors that really drove that. Uh, number one, is the dramatic change in the global media environment. And I know we're all nodding now because we're thinking about social media, but I would even push it further. I'm thinking about 24-hour news channels, competitive ones. I'm going even further and I'm thinking about the innovation of the video camera, which basically allowed it to document um, potentially or controversial, let's call them controversial corporate practices very quickly and very effectively. And uh, NGOs were some of the first adopters to that and already utilized this very effectively uh, in the early 90s, for example. So that's number one. Number two, uh, I would say, is really the, the, the dramatic growth in the globalization of business. And by globalization, I don't just mean we're selling stuff in a whole bunch of other markets or China has entered or the BRICS. I mean now that most multinational companies or large companies really have a globally integrated value chain. And we have learned now, in part, you know, by our colleagues that worry about that stuff, is that you have to identify what you do and what you don't do in a very smart way. You have the outsourcing movement, you have a question of where do you get your best engineers, where do you supply, all that has created these very complex value creation networks that operate globally. Now that's a, that's a good thing and that's interesting, but boy has it made companies vulnerable. And that's the, I would say that's the unintended consequence of the dark side of living in a flat world, right? I mean, you take a company like, like, uh, like Apple, that was one of the recent targets um, of uh, corporate activism over labor conditions. Now, it wasn't that the, that the problems were at Apple factories in China, because there are no Apple factories in China, right? That is all done by contract manufacturers. But the, the way this works is if you want to have an impact 
uh, with respect to Foxconn, which is their main contractor, you're not going after Foxconn because people confuse that with Fox TV, right? I have no idea who that is. You go after Apple. So good activists understand that and have learned how to leverage and utilize these global value chain networks to have maximal social impact, especially in countries where you cannot utilize the political channels effectively. So that's number two. Number three, I think, is just a change in our expectations for what we expect good corporate conduct to be. Now, we ha I know we have this debate, and you know, Judy and I, we've had this many times, this question about like uh, shareholder value and all of that. From a practical point of view, most customers and most audiences in the world expect more from companies than just to maximize money and stay within the law of where they're located. Uh, we have expectations of sustainability policies, animal welfare, labor policies, community engagement, diversity, and, 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 and that's just table stakes. So you don't get a price anymore to have a sustainability policy. That's just basically what it means to play. And if you're not playing, you're going to have immediate difficulties on that. So there's, a, there's, a, there's all these values that go beyond shareholder value are now the reality for most globally operating companies. And then the last one, which I think is not really appreciated, is that uh, many business models is really more and more require maintained trust with their customers. I mean, you can't buy a cup of coffee without buying an experience these days, right? It's not, it's, it's like those days are over. And that's, that's, that's great. People love it. You can make a lot of money. You can build new brands on that. But think about the, the flip side of that, right? You live by the brand, you die by the brand. The same people that come and want to spend four bucks for a cup of Starbucks coffee and enjoy it and feel good about themselves get very ticked off if they feel that you're cutting down the rainforest in order to build more coffee plantations, or not you, but your supplier. So these reputation-based strategies or trust-based strategies are fragile because they depend very much on the perceptions that, or that customers and other audiences have about you. So to the extent that it is trust or reputation, a good reputation, that is a sustainable competitive advantage in today's marketplace, that opens up new venues as to have an impact on that. And I think deep down, that's really why an Apple feels they have to respond it's not that they're worried about an impact on their share price. It's not that they're worried about what their suppliers think. I don't think so. I think what they're worried about is that people no longer love the company, that they have this emotional bond with Apple and people feel good about it, and they do not want to lose that because it's a huge asset, and they do not want the response that you had with respect to Nike, where people feel now something negative associated with the brand. Now, if you look at these four factors, I don't think any one of them is going to reverse anytime soon. So my sense is, is that this trend is just going to continue, it's going to grow, and it's going to challenge multinational companies to find strategically meaningful responses that allow them to manage these challenges in an effective way. Interesting. And, and, and actually, I mean, to your point about the, the complexity of the supply chain, I mean, it's very difficult for companies to actually find out what's going on. I mean, Absolutely. Um, there was a, I think it was, uh, again, I go back to Unilever because they are, you know, uh, do some interesting stuff in this area, but they've just done a report with Oxfam looking at their human rights in um, Vietnam. And this was, a, this was a report that they participated in with, you know, willingly with Oxfam. And it came up with some pretty negative results that Unilever had no idea was going on in these, you know, supplier factories in, in Vietnam. So, you know, it's, it's, it's pretty challenging for, for companies. But um, so perhaps I'll go on to, to the corporate response here. I mean, how have you seen, uh, how do activists interact with, with you, um, Susan, and, and how does your company respond if they do? I think we've really seen an evolution in how we um, work with NGOs and local community organizations over the last 10 to 20 years. Quite frankly, when I first um, got into this business, I'd say we tried to ignore them as much as we could. And um, when we did work with local, um, mostly local, but also national organizations, we really expended a lot of time trying to teach them how great we were and convince them to see what we, that what we were doing was the right thing and that they should love us and embrace what we were doing um, regardless of what it was. And funny thing, we pretty soon figured out that wasn't working for us anymore, or never did work for 
course very well, but it certainly wasn't working as we've talked about in the changing environment of activism and media, et cetera. We really had to have a shift in what we were doing. And what was so interesting about it as we started to really listen to the folks that we were engaging with, get engaged and really listen, what we realized is they didn't like our business model. They really didn't like what we were doing, which was taking waste and putting it into land intensive landfills. So actually, we started to incorporate the wisdom of these organizations we've been working with. And it's really, I would say, it has had a profound impact on what we've done as a company with our business model. We've really shifted that quite a bit. And we've started to internalize that and really throughout the beauty of it is the messaging isn't just external it's an internal messaging effort and so once you do that then you start to build on itself and it really does shape the way you're doing business with these organizations and I'm interested in how you what what's what's the model for working with these organizations because you know there are there are different ways of doing it and I think a lot of uh, uh, there was some sort of a pushback against some of these things because a lot of NGOs were like well we're just being used as free consultants right um, and and how do you do that I mean one of the one of the approaches I think is quite interesting is environmental defense fund which works with a lot of companies and um, does some quite transformational work with them that actually also benefits their bottom line and they take no money at all from corporations now some people say well you know, uh, you're getting free consultancy and there's Walmart, you know, having made a huge profit out of its green light bulbs or FedEx with its, um, with its hybrid vehicles. Mm -hmm. But it, allay, it allows EDF to continue to be an activist at the same time because they're not beholden. Um, how do you, what's the relationship that you, you set up with, with NGOs when you're working with them? I'd say there's two, two different ways to look at that. One is we, we have about a thousand different facilities across the country, across North America. We have 18,000 trucks operating every day um, across North America. So we have a lot that we do locally because we're really a visual reminder of an impact in a community. So we spend a lot of time and effort and we have a lot of professionals who are working to understand what the issues are in local communities across North America. And that's a really important feedback loop for us. Um, once we start to listen and really engage and take seriously what the needs of a local community are and start to filter that internally, that plays a huge role in how we then, in turn, work with the organizations, the local organizations. So that's certainly, I think, an important level of what we're doing. And then we also work at a national level with different organizations. We've been very um, active in um, environmental justice efforts and um, really worked across the country, both um, from with, with government agencies, with local organizations, national organizations. We actually are working with the Environmental Defense Fund. We do that quite a bit. We're involved in a study right now there was, um, you may have read, um, I think it was yesterday or the day before, a press release. And our, you know, our perspective there, it's on measuring methane emissions. So the company has made a commitment to transform its fleet to natural gas. And again, there are a lot of reasons for it, but the direct benefits to local communities are potentially dramatic. And so working with the EDF in the emissions work that they're doing, a lot of companies chose not to participate in the study. Mm -hmm. And our perspective is if we don't participate, it's kind of like I suppose uh, participating in um, government. If you don't participate, you can't complain. So by participating, we understand, and I will tell you, I understand the perspective much better as a participant in this study. Um, and the impacts will be profound to us as we invest in a future fleet, a, a greenhouse gas emission um, environmentally beneficial um, uh, fleet, and that study will result ultimately um, in financial impacts to us. So um, it's a it's a great I think partnership for us really to see and understand the the effort that they're making. And is it important for you that these organisations retain their activist edge? I think we would expect it. I, in right. fact, we go into it never, ever anticipating anything <laughs> other than that. We're, we are, in fact, I will tell you that's the other beautiful thing about it is we are full of cynics within our company. We have many people who have been around for a long time. So as we can participate in this dialogue, we gain a lot of education internally as well. Right. But we go in with a healthy dose, I think it is a healthy dose, yeah. of an expectation that there is still that tension yeah. that exists. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Well, um, um, perhaps you might talk now a little bit about Baxter International and when you know from your time there uh, what was your experience of this sort of tension between working with NGOs you know campaign groups um, sure sort of thing? okay well um, 
when I when I think about this, and I, I probably can get accused of, of trying to make this overly simple, but when I look at this rethinking shareholder value purpose of the corporation, um, I just see a, um, a very strong correlation between this topic and just really understanding what the individual values are of the people in the organization, the values of the company, and, and really how that has evolved. So uh, very simply, the way I think about it is I, I always say I went to school here a couple of years ago, and people correct me, it was 35 years ago. Uh, and and as, a, as a generalization, when I was here 35 years ago, I think the folks in finance uh, pretty much taught us that the purpose of what you ought to be focusing on is creating shareholder value. And I think a lot of us would almost sort of raise the question of, well, wait a minute, there's a lot of other things going on. No, but wait a minute, you focus on shareholder value, and the people who own the company, they'll decide what they're going to do, how socially responsible they'll be, or whatever. But I, I think a lot of the folks in my generation that eventually ended up becoming CEOs of companies, I think you, if you actually step back and think about the value side of this, and actually keep it simple so you don't confuse yourself, we would be in meetings, and I don't mean at the CEO, but when we were director level, vice president, you'd sit in a meeting and say to yourself, all right, boy, this may sound kind of confusing because we've got shareholders, we've got all these stakeholders, we've got society, we've got corporate responsibility, we have customers, we have team members. Boy, th this, is a, this is a whole lot to juggle. And boy, but you know, remember this focus on shareholder value. And I think what a lot of folks did, basically they tried to keep it very simple. And I think the approach we had at Baxter, and I don't think it wasn't different from a lot of other companies, we said, all right, what is shareholder value? Well, shareholder value is important. We can't walk away from that. But in a very simple way, and, and excuse me as a former math guy, uh, shareholder value, I think, is sort of the dependent variable, right? That's what you're going to achieve. And I think a lot of us just said, all right, how do I get shareholder value? Well, I think the way I get shareholder value is I better have the absolute best people I better have a phenomenal relationship with customers. And by the way, uh, those people in the, in the firm and those customers actually expect us to do the right thing. So even if, even if you said, well, boy, I, I think I'm just focused on shareholder value, I think if you thought about this, you said, all right, how are we going to generate it? Well, we better have unbelievable people. And I think as somebody referenced already, if you're going to have unbelievable people, particularly in this generation, you better be doing something that people feel good about. Because, you know, I have five children. None of them are going to want to work for a company that they don't respect. So you better be doing the right thing or you're not going to have the best people, number one. And I always would tease people uh, related to customers, right? If, if Daniel's a customer and he has a, uh, the choice of buying the product from either Susan or I, and I am really focused on shareholder value. That's what I'm focused on. And Susan is focused on doing the right thing, treating people well, and so on. If, if the price of our products are pretty similar, and the quality of the product is pretty similar. Most customers, ITs, are human beings. There's a few exceptions, but most customers are human beings. They're probably going to buy the product from Susan, right? So again, in keeping it very simple, I'm going to do the social responsible thing, I think because I think it's the morally correct thing to do. But even if I didn't, if I want to have the best people and a great relationship with customers, I think that's how I'm going to generate shareholder value. So I've never viewed this as this conflict. You know, I, it's funny, maybe as an operating guy, I've always loved to read and I'm reading these articles and this incredible conflict. I could never figure out what the conflict was. So when we talk then about these groups, my perspective was always if some NGO wants to talk to us and they've got some view, if, if from a value standpoint, you have no agenda other than doing the right thing, well then come on down, Sarah, let's talk about it. We'll explain what we're doing. We'll explain why we're doing it. If you think there's a better way to do it, we're open to it. Why? We've got no agenda other than try to do the right thing for the people, for the team, for the customer, and I think we'll generate shareholder value. And, and so I've never allowed myself in 20-some years at Baxter, now Madison, Dearborn Church, I've never allowed myself to make it more complicated. And I try to keep it simple. I don't not I get confused what CSR stands for and all this stuff. I keep it very simple. All right? Do the right thing. Be very open. And by the way, when you say you want to do the right thing, I'd always tell the teams, when you say you want to do the right thing, that makes one enormous assumption. What is the right thing? So you better surround yourself with similar valued people. Better talk to Liz. Better talk to Dan. I better find people that will help me get to do the right thing because from a leadership standpoint, we're not trying to be right. We're trying to do the right thing. Now, what, what are the dangers here? I mean, the, so everything you're saying makes absolute sense. 
Um, but the, the, your critical last point was you better make sure the right thing is the right thing. Right. Um, the the um, companies that that have um, what's the, what are the dangers of sticking your head above the parapet, which inevitably you will have to do if you're being um, you know confronted or attacked by by uh, activists. Of um, you know the, there's a sort of so much a misperception out there, and I'll just give you one again a little example. Um, I've been writing about the um, the Nike Kasky case, which was when Nike was sued for using um, press releases as, as public speech uh, about their you know as, as advertising about their um, you know their conditions in their um, labour sweatshops and and. Uh, the whole thing kind of resulted, they ended up settling the case. And then after that, there was quite a lot of silence. A lot of companies would not put out sort of corporate responsibility reports, things like that. There was a fear, I think, that, you know, you wrote anything about this, you, it was going to be pulled apart. And, and, and a big report came out, I think it was a few years after that gap, um, working with NGOs very closely, produced this kind of, I don't know if anybody remembers it, but it was a real warts and all. They, and they, I think it was the one where they, did, they disclosed the names of all their factories, which was something quite new as well. And generally, it received quite a lot of uh, recognition, particularly from NGOs and, and from um, other people in business and, and concerned stakeholders. But so, I, I mean, that was the story that I wrote, you know, well, isn't this interesting that the, the Gap is doing this, even though the, the, since the nike Caskey case, there's been a bit of hesitancy about, you know, being out there publicly. And, um, and that was the story that went in the FT. But um, I got home that evening, and I turned on the local, there was a local TV news station. And there was a sort of 30 minute, 30 second um, thing on, on some really, really, I'm amazed it even got on there at all, some local uh, channel. And it just said, massive abuses uncovered by report in Gap factories. <laughs> And there was no, there was no uh, mention of the fact that Gap had actually produced the report itself, working with NGOs, um, you know, and, and that it had been approved for doing so. So, um, you know, perhaps talk a little bit about the dangers there, Susan, of, of you know, how do you stick your head above the parapet safely? That's a scary one. <laughs> <laughs> I think um, we have a team of folks that's very sensitive to the communication that we participate in, and I think by really um, stepping back, being cautious, thinking through strategically what we're doing. Um, we can limit the exposure and limit the risk. And at the same time, I think we are going to have that exposure and that risk. We can't control. We, we can't, we simply can't control. And we have to, I think, take a broader look at the long time, um, overall long term effort that we're taking. And I think the beauty is we've done that as a company. We've been, you know, it is, I think if you look back over the last 10 years, we've been very consistent. And it is a branding effort. And it is something that does now establish who we are in the community and it changes who wants to work for us it changes the quality of our employee changes the quality of the employees so you have to have that broad look and that broad brand look and then find ways to minimize the risk as we can um, recognizing and, and I can think of a few instances where we you know we work very hard to try to make sure that we are um, reducing our uh, the we're, we're helping to shape the conversation and participate in that conversation to hope at the end of the day what what is what um, what is read and seen is the message that we're hoping to convey. Mm -hmm. I'd like to get Daniel and Braden to come in on this from having looked at this very broadly over a period of time. And Braden, how has the media changed the way this this plays out? So let me also talk a little bit about the risk of putting yourself out there. Because um, I was listening to your comments, I think. Well, first of all, I think that it's always a good idea to engage with activists when they're willing to talk. Uh, because you can learn innovation comes actually from, from listening to people who have more experience at a grassroots level. But I think we're absolutely wrong if we think that by engaging with activists, we are somehow protecting ourselves from the risks of being uh, threatened by activists in the future. And the reason for this is because one, there are just a lot of us, a lot of different activist group out there, and these activist groups have different agendas and use different kinds of tactics. And to really understand um, what activists are trying to do, you kind of have to get inside of the head of the activists mm -hmm. themselves. I, I, I did an interview once with a, a group of activists who are boycotting a local uh, cinema franchise, a movie theater franchise, um, because the owner had donated uh, money to Proposition 8, the California Proposition. These were, these were gay rights activists. 
And um, they were boycotting the, 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 the theater, and they were also protesting outside of one of the theaters. Very large protest. It got the Chicago Tribune to cover it. And um, I asked them, well, what are you going to do if, what do you expect the owner of this uh, franchise to do? What, what, are you, what are you hoping to get from the negotiations? Uh, and they kind of paused and had nothing to say. And, and then one of them said, well, we, actually, we, that, that's not the goal. <laughs> that's not what we're trying to do. We have no plan for negotiate, negotiating with them. What we're hoping is that we can use this event to draw attention to our cause. We want the media to cover this cause because we believe that's the way we're going to get people to talk about this issue. That's the way we're going to get society to change. So the corporation, for many of these activists, is not the object of change. Mm -hmm. It's the platform of change. They're using the corporation as a th uh, and the media as a theater to get uh, people to, to listen and to talk about these ideas and debate about them so that we can actually make uh, progress as a society for, uh, from their point of view. And uh, <clears throat> while that probably works well for society, it doesn't always work well for the company. And in fact, um, if you sort of take this logic, the, um, it turns out that companies that are putting themselves out there and trying to do a lot of good are sometimes those companies that are actually the most at risk of being targeted by activists in the future. So in one of our, the studies that we've done, we found that there are two things that seem to predict whether you're going to be targeted by activists in the future. And those two things are, interestingly enough, the, the things that companies think protect them from being targeted by activists. One is the reputation of the company. So the belief is that if you have a great reputation, you're admired, people think that you're, you're great, that somehow this is going to protect you because they're going to see, give you the benefit of the doubt. It's going to have this halo effect. But in reality, com activists want media attention. And so they're going to target those companies that are visible and that have a lot of prestige because the media the main, uh, are going to cover more ev those events with, with uh, um, they're going to give more newspaper space to companies that tend to have those reputations. The other thing that seems to predict uh, uh, whether you're targeted or not is actually the, the amount of, of uh, CSR, the amount of pro, we call it, it pro-social activities that companies have done in the past. So if you're a company that is actively trying to out, do outreach in your community and do lots of philanthropy, give to the local boys club, um, engage with environmental groups, ironically, you're actually putting yourself out there more because it increases the expectations that people have of you. And the activists smartly, I mean, the really public, uh, those that are savvy in public relations, realize that this makes a better target than a company that has never said, we try to do anything but make, make a profit. Like if all you, if all you care about is that the, the, the stock price coming, you never pretended otherwise, then why would anybody be surprised that you're polluting the environment? Why would anybody be surprised that you are um, um, exploiting your, your, uh, your workers? So it's actually the companies that have great reputations and that are doing a lot of good that make the best targets for activists. So you're, you're all screwed either way. <laughs> well, that's one way of looking at it. You could also say that what's happened over time is that it's forced companies to become better and better at engaging mm -hmm. with activists. Yeah. And so what we're seeing is kind of a virtuous circle where more, th more, more threat, more criticism, criticism from the outside mm -hmm. has forced them to improve what they do internally. Right. And that doesn't protect them from threat, but it does allow there to be a, sort of this continuous cycle of improvement. Yeah. Actually, it's, I mean, it's really interesting you should say that. Funnily enough, I'm moderating two panels right now because <laughs> I'm also moderating, moderating an online panel for the Economist Intelligence Unit. And we've had a ton of com comments come in. And it is amazing how cynical people still see, are about CSR. I mean, all the comments are, oh, it's just, you know, it's just a greenwash for you know, covering up other things. So, I mean, we've really had a lot of comments around that. Um, uh, the, the other thing is, um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it, it's interesting that um, the, from a personal perspective, one thing I'd like to mention at this point is, uh, and, and perhaps put it back to, to you guys, is um, the difficulties of corporations in, in sort of being honest and, and, and then the fact that they don't always get rewarded for being honest, as in you know, the, the gap report that I, uh, I cited earlier. Um, but one of the one of the difficulties it seems to me is that there's a um, there's you know there's a there's a great sort of corporate America kind of uh, you know front that says we can't possibly ever admit that we've made any mistakes 
And yet, ironically, I think that's what people want to hear most because it, it gives the corporation a kind of credibility and an honesty that, that, that people are looking for. Um, so, um, you know, that's something that as a, as a journalist writing about this, I find, you know, people write and send me these press releases about their CSR programs. And I'm like, well, no, I want to know what problems you had and how you fixed them. But it's much more difficult to get companies to talk about that publicly, but, you know, perhaps there are reasons. Daniel, how have you seen companies, uh, you know, we've, this has been a very fast changing world. We've seen, you know, the, in, the, the internet and social media suddenly, it, you know, exploded the possibility for anybody around the world, as you say, to use any, any medium to, to highlight an issue. How fast have, have companies really been at reacting to this and adapting? Not fast enough. So I think that uh, the kind of trajectory that, that Susan highlighted, I think is very typical. There's a kind of like, um, um, I would say, kind of a growing up uh, of um, operating in this environment. And I think you, the first thing that happens is that uh, if you've never been targeted by, uh, by an activist group, um, and you know, Apple is not a bad example for that, which really kind of hasn't had a lot of difficulties compared to other companies, the first thing is just you kind of, you, you, you just can't believe what was, I think that this quote was, which I thought was great, they should love us. Right? Why, they, why, why is this happening to me? We're a good company, right? We're doing all these things. We gave, you know, 20 million to a cancer hospital yesterday. Or these other companies are much worse. Why aren't you going after that? So that's kind of like, you know, it's kind of like the stages of grieving, right? So kind of the first thing is you kind of, you can't believe it. And then you get angry. And, and at the end of the day, you know, there's negotiation and acceptance at some point. And I think that this is, this is a dimension where we still, where many corporate leaders still have this kind of, a kind of really naive view, view of how the world works. That, that's my sense. And they're just like, they can be super sophisticated when they deal with competitors, and then they have to deal with Greenpeace, and suddenly we're back in like in preschool land. It's really striking. <laughs> um, and I mean, let me just point that out, right? And Braden has pointed out some of the complexities um, of this interaction. The first thing that people believe, I think, is that when an activist goes after that, they're being punished for bad behavior. Right? And sometimes that happens. So uh, the example that you talked about is one, and uh, a particular kind of moral issues, gender issues you have that people just get outraged and then they kind of protest. Typically, these are not sophisticated activists. These are kind of like kind of community outrage or people that are like just kind of unhappy, and that kind of becomes a headache for the company and goes away. Now, when you talk to the big boys in the business, like a Greenpeace or Rainforest Action Network or people that really understand how this works, they have a completely different mindset. The way they do this is they have their strategy meetings once or twice a year, and they sit there with a whiteboard and then they ask themselves, okay, so what should we, what do we care about? Let's say we care about palm oil, right? Because palm oil is a big threat uh, to rainforests in particular in Asia and in Africa. That's a worry, right? And then they look back and think like, okay, so mm, how do we do this? Do we, do we protest in front of the Indonesian embassy? No, nobody. Remember people did that in the 70s? Nobody does that anymore because <laughs> it's, it's a silly thing to do. How about we set up a United Nations Commission to investigate? You just kind of, we did that, right? It's just like, but in today's day and age, it's laughable. So what they do is they look at and they say like, which company will give us the biggest media attention? That's one huge factor, which has the biggest reach. So if I move them, they're going to move lots of suppliers and maybe move the entire industry. So it's really like a strategic question of like, I have limited campaign funds. I want to have a big splash. I want to have a big impact. How do I do it? And the good ones know. The good ones know. So in this particular case, the biggest target was Nestle. And why Nestle? Not one reason, because they had trouble in the 70s over milk powder. So this whole connection that you pointed out before, right, with like a Nike and Nestle, still think of things we think about, even though they have moved away from that, number one. Number two, big brand name. Number three, multinational. Number four, big buyer of palm oil. Palm oil is used in many baked and chocolate items and things like that. And then the next thing is, how do you do this? Well, you go after Kit Kat. Why Kit Kat? Because kids love Kit Kat and the whole emotional connection comes in. So that's a super simplified kind of one-on-one -on -one version of how a campaign works. And then you do it, you have, you know, Cindy Crawford gets involved or Lady Gaga or whatever. I mean, it's just like how you do it, right? And the reason you do it that way is not because you hate Nestle or not because you don't like Kit Kat. It has nothing to do with it. The only question is, how do I have the maximal impact, policy impact on an area that I think is critical for the future of the world? It's all that matters, right? 
And now, so what's the mindset? The mindset is they're, they think like regulators, right? They think like regulators that are not using governments or courts or elections because in many cases they're ineffective or they don't exist. I mean, if you want to regulate the diamond trade in West Africa, try to go to a court. Which one would that be, right? It's not, it doesn't exist. So they have realized this, that they can leverage global supply chain to engender social change. And then the good ones do it strategically. Now, if you're a company now, right, you got to understand that. You got to understand that if you're McDonald's, right, Greenpeace is as likely to go away as Burger King. It's just not going to happen. It's not because you're bad. It's not because they hate you. They may. But that's not the point. The point is because you have a, you have a humongous impact on this business. You're, well, you're right out there. You're a vulnerable brand. You have that whole thing with Ronald McDonald. And that all makes you a good target, right? By the way, that's also true by companies. So one of the things that drives people crazy is the sense, well, we're already doing all of that, right? We're making all these wonderful things. Why are you going after us? Because activists always want you to do more. That's what they want. They want you to do more. And so one way in, in order to encourage you to go more, to do more is to prevent you from coasting. So whenever that seems like you're just kind of at the point where like, you know, there's no much more reputation risk, we bang you down a little bit. And then you have an incentive again. <laughs> Works beautifully, right? It's like, a, it's, and the companies have to understand that. It's like, a, there's nothing magical about it. There's a, there's a particular logic of how this operates. But we have to, I think, from a company point of view, kind of kiss these naive ideas goodbye. And that, by the way, also means that sometimes, the way you described it, right? Sometimes Greenpeace is a friend, and some is an enemy, and maybe at the same time. But remember, we do this in our business too. Sometimes a competitor is a competitor, one time it's a supplier, and sometimes they're a customer. So this whole kind of like black and white thinking, good ones, bad ones, and so forth, or punitive or anything, that's just not appropriate anymore. And it takes a while, I think, to think that through and to understand how this affects my company, because let's not kid ourselves, right? Wendy's is not as vulnerable as McDonald's for exactly the reason that I pointed out. Now that makes people at McDonald's unhappy and maybe people at Wendy's happy, but it means that the, that the way they want to think about this will differ from industry, value structure, brand positioning, history, all makes a difference. And it's just like, it's just going to become something that we have to think through carefully for the specific company that we're dealing with. Well, I mean, it's, uh, uh, as you say, they, they, companies haven't moved fast enough on this and yet, now there's another whole problem to deal with, which is that uh, your activists are no longer necessarily organized groups like Greenpeace and Oxfam. They're your customers on Twitter, and um, which is another form of activism that can be equally powerful. Um, perhaps I'll ask um, you, you guys, Susan and um, Henry, would you, would you say that that is, is really changing things for companies in the way that, uh, you know, are they treating that as a form of activism? Yes, I mean obviously that's just one more tool. That's one more. Uh, that's one more thing that's out there. Um, but again, I just sort of take the view, you know, based on, on Daniel's comments. As an organization, are you going to do the right thing? And are you wired up to do that? Do you have the mechanisms in place to have enough folks who can help you make sure you're doing it? Um, and I love Daniel's comment. This is the real world, right? I mean, as my grandfather would say, that's why they call it work, right? That's why you have customers. That's why you got competitors. You know, and anybody who's naive enough that you know to think that that everybody's going to do things in a logical way, that's why they call it work. So um, that's why you get paid. So you deal with it. And uh, there's, I think, it's going to be more easy for more people. They don't even have to be part of an organization. Um, and are you, as a team, prepared that whatever is going to happen? you're as prepared as you possibly can be. I have to say, being on the receiving side of this, um, how fast something can move with social media right now, how quickly your day can be ruined by, um, <laughs> by an event. And, uh, and it is, it's about, I like the stages of grieving, because if, if you haven't been on the receiving end of it, it really does go through a step process. The anger that you feel, you know, how do you react, you pull together your team, what do you do, you kind of move through the whole stage as you're dealing with an event. Um, and it is, I think 
The other point that you made was the team. I think having that right team in place to be able to manage through those processes, because how you, I, I've always said, it's not so much when either you make a mistake or you have an event like this, it's how you manage it and how you come out with it on the other end. And the mistakes are made when you do something stupid along the way. So it, yeah, we don't like it when it happens, it's unfortunate, but really what we've learned is it's as much about how we then manage through it to get to the other side mm -hmm. um, that really is important for us for that big picture look. Yes, and actually that's the, those are the stories that I want to tell in the Financial <laughs> Times and that actually makes me think of my mother who, who uh, many, many years ago passed her driving test despite having driven right over a traffic circle. <laughs> and uh, when she got to the other side of it and she, you know, they finished the test and everything and she said, she was like, oh, of course I failed, oh, what, oh, what was I thinking? Um, and he passed her, she said, what, what did you mean? He said, well, you did drive over the traffic circle, but you got out of it in the most fantastic <laughs> way. <laughs> so my mom knows about these things. Um, so I'm going to open it up to some questions now. If, um, if anybody would, oh, there's a quick hand going up there. Um, please feel free. So uh, what do you think about these forces? We've got, um, here you mentioned that the, uh, uh, the percentage of people that will switch brands based on uh, similar quality and price, <coughs> if it supports a cost. Uh, the data shows that 88% of millennials will, spit, will switch their brand preference, buy something different if it supports, uh, if it's, if it's um, same quality, same price, and then it's cause focused, okay? You talked about activists. Well, it, they are actually our employees now because 88% 80, of uh, millennials will switch companies based on CRS values. So now we've got internal employees that are really activists in the digital world, you know, using social media to communicate. They have buying power. Um, bring that to the apparel industry, that's 150 billion plus industry in America, you know, we'll talk about Nike and Gap and people like that. How do we leverage all that to, um, to, to move forward and benefit you know, causes and um, engage our employees and, and improve the value of the business and help solve the problems for the world? Well, you know, again, the, the way I always uh, thought about it at Baxter and now for our, our company through Madison Dearborn is this whole thing again, you know, Susan mentioned, you know, getting the team together. And I mean a very diverse team of people. Uh, different ages, different backgrounds, if you're a global company, different people from around the world, um, and talking openly about these things, all right? Uh, where do we stand now versus competition? What are we doing well? What aren't we doing well? What could happen? And, and I, I usually build these things on this whole basis of, of um, setting expectations and, and minimizing the surprise. You know, because if you think about a lot of the things Dion talked about, I would argue if you're a reasonably bright person, and if you got a pretty good team, most of the things that happen to you, you can predict. Not everything, but you can actually kind of predict. If you're big, if you're successful, if you're profitable, somebody's probably got it out for you, okay? So don't be surprised. In fact, whenever I would run into somebody surprised, you know, I talk to Miguel, Miguel says, I'm, I'm surprised. I'm really surprised I'm looking at you. You're surprised. I'm looking at you. There's no question you're surprised. What I can't figure out is, why the heck are you surprised? Okay. Um, so again, if you've got a great those ifs, if you've got a great team, if you thought through what could go wrong, if you thought through all the possibilities, if you thought through what else could we do to build a better team, better collaboration, people feeling better about the company, the team you have, if we thought about what could we do to get closer to customers, have customers feel that we're doing something special, and you're thinking about those things, and you incorporate those into what you do. I think the chance of you being more successful is higher, and you're always predicting what could possibly go wrong. You can't eliminate, but you minimize the surprise. I'm all about minimizing the surprise. Can't, can't eliminate it, but I can minimize it if I've really got a great team, and we're constantly talking about these things. Daniel, you wanted to come in on Yeah, so I, I, th I think this is a great question, and um, um, I think it highlights another dimension of this whole question, which is you know kind of the employee side, the talent side, the people. Right, attracting top talent, and of course, for many companies, that's huge. So I'll, uh, I think there are like a, a couple of interesting dimensions to that. The first thing is, is that uh, you see this really, really important now, an important issue for consulting companies, really important. So I spent um, a few
few years ago some time with a very large consulting company. It wasn't McKinsey. They were bigger than McKinsey. And uh, the, remember, the, the chairman said to told me, you know, in his history, in the history when he was on top of this, he has been running this company for a few years, no issue has, has increased on the CEO's agenda as quickly as the issue of sustainability. No single one. I thought it was striking. Not globalization or anything like that. And then we had a long discussion on like, um, what does this mean for your people, right? The people you attract. And I, it was just stunning how many of them really wanted to know. And he told me, right? We're sitting there and it says like, you know, so we're hiring people in Brazil. I said, okay, Brazil, you know, emerging brick. I, I kind of know how that works, right? And he said like, well, the first thing they want to know, what are they working on? So is it, is it me? Is that kind of, are they engaged? The second question is, what's your sustainability policy? Uh, striking, right? Now, no, I think when people think about that, sometimes they believe that's kind of a luxury phenomenon, right? Let them have like some tough times and then that's gonna go away and then they're gonna go back to the good old values, right, from the 50s. That's not the case. And uh, the reason why it's not is when you look at some research on that, there's, um, there's a pretty profound change in value orientation going on globally and the way people, the research are called, it's kind of a shift from materialist to post-materialist values. And, uh, and, you know, there's a whole story for why that is, but it's going on not just in the U.S., not just in Europe, but it's going on all over the world. And the people that have these more post-materialist or orientation, yes, they want to have a good job. Yes, they want to have a nice lifestyle. Yes, they want to go on a skiing vacation. But what they really care about is that what they do is meaningful and consistent with the value orientation that they have. And very often that has a social environmental component to that. And if you're not responding to that, you're going to have a trauma. You're going to have a problem. Not true for every company. But we, we'll see it particularly right now at companies where, where the competition for talent is the highest. Um, and, uh, and that's where you're going to think, I'm gonna, you're going to see these trends, not just on the customer side, but on the, on the talent side, um, much more pronounced. Interesting. Yeah. Um, Judy. Well, I'm, I love the waste management story um, because it's not just about the past point of being just about risk management. It sounds like you have, as a result of the you know, external pressures, you're actually fundamentally think, rethinking the business model. And that's you know, it's about risk, but it's, it somehow feels like it's going beyond that. So I'm kind of curious just for the rest of the <coughs> Um, is, is that a trend that, you know, that as a result of external pressures, you think that companies are actually getting past the point of saying, I need to make sure that the supply chain is clean, or I need to make sure that, you know, I'm not too involved in X, Y, Z. That, are you seeing other evidence of, like, do you have other examples? So I, I can, I can just, you know, respond to that directly. So the answer is yes, uh, but it depends on the company. And uh, for some, I mean, you mentioned some examples, the Walmart, the light bulbs is a great example, and the, like, uh, you know, the hybrid trucks, and sometimes you can identify new product lines, so there's new innovation uh, that comes with that, so that can happen. Um, now, the question, that the, the cynics, right, among us then ask themselves, oh, wait a minute, if this was a good business idea anyway, why didn't they do it, wouldn't they have done it anyway, right? So I think that's not, that's not the right way to think about it, because I think what happens very often is that when you are interacting with active, activist groups, right, what it does, it gives you a different heuristic to come up with new ideas. It's just like, I mean, one way in which innovation happens, right, is that you have, you kind of put things together that hadn't been put, thing, put, put together before, and you wouldn't have thought if you're Walmart, for example, right, that smaller package sizes is really why you want to spend your energy on. But once there is, once you look at the material that's used for packaging and you get pressure on that, then you can ask yourself, well, can I turn this into an advantage, right? In Walmart's case, of course, the way their business is structured, it's a cost advantage. In other cases, it can be a new product or a new menu item if you're in the restaurant business, right? So that can happen. But I think that the way you want to think about it is that being exposed to these different perspectives, right, whether it's environmental or social, can, can kind of trigger a different kind of innovation that otherwise wouldn't have happened. Can I ask a follow-up on that since you put Walmart back on the table? It is certainly, I believe, that fundamentally Walmart's business model of always lowest price is more part of the problem than part of the solution. Could can external forces put that on the table only for Walmart? Or is that 
Well, I mean, they would have to really change the business model from being a line of kind of low price, low cost leader to something else. That may happen. I don't see it. I don't see it there dramatically. It's possible, right? But I think what you have there is like um, you want to, if you're an activist, for example, you want to leverage that. You want to leverage like a, a mindset that's low cost driven. And you can say like, you know, that's a problem. Or you can say, well, I want to target them or I want to work with them. Right to see whether whether there's a, where there is an alignment between low cost and environmental responsibility. In some cases there is, in other cases there's not. So I think these things are very company specific. You take another company that's not a low, that's not really in the low low cost business, like Starbucks. That's a whole other story, whole other conversation. So I think these these strategies have to be aligned with the fundamental business model and the nature of the competition. Yeah, so I think if you were to look at that group of firms that are among like the fortunes most admired firms, these are the most prestigious firms that also have the greatest reputational risk. These are the firms that are constantly being targeted. And my guess is if you looked at them, this, these are also the firms that are doing the innovating and they're leading the way for the, the other uh, companies that are in, in their industries to adapt as well. But they are forced to innovate because they are the ones that are being targeted by these activists. And I think part of the point I was trying to make before with this, rip, uh, this sort of virtuous circle is that they're actually developing capabilities in the process that distinguish them from other, other companies. So because they've been targeted so much, they've actually developed distinct pro-social capabilities that have helped them to really innovate on the social side of their firm. And they may not see immediate, you know, it's hard to like translate that in, immediately into shareholder value. But it does give them advantages in dealing with reputational risk going forward. And each of them are going to do it in their own way. I mean, Walmart's capability isn't to change. I mean, it certainly would be against the, the firm's best interest to, to um, develop a capability that was against its core strategy, which is to do low cost always, low, the lowest price always. But it certainly has found a way to align it with environment an environmental sustainability strategy. Um, whereas other companies have really made their whole uh, core strategy oriented around this sort of pro-social capability that they're developing. So it's going to look different in each firm. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yes. Um, I'd like to give a little context of one evolution of a, uh, a relationship between a corporation and an activist organization. But I promise at the end of it, there actually is a question. I <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, during the 1980s, I was the senior vice president of General Motors who had responsibility for these kinds of issues, both in the environmental staff and the government relations staff and so forth. And we were the first major multinational to form a relationship with the environmental defense fund. And at first, we approached each other kind of like two porcupines making love. Um, but everybody was very wary. They were more wary of being associated with us than we were of being associated with them. But we inched toward a relationship. And after I left the company, two stages developed. Um, one was that ultimately the uh, EDF and the GM environmental staff put together, put out a joint report and in which the EDF praised GM substantially for the progress that it made on environmental issues in its uh, plants. At the same time, it criticized GM very heavily for its continued objection to the corporate average fuel economy. Mm. So they put out a joint report. In one part, they were clearly in line. In another part, they agreed to disagree. Now, of course, finally, and I've been gone from the company for 20 years, General Motors has finally changed its business plan to actually come around to support the corporate average fuel economy standards and finally say what it denied for decades that yes, they could meet those standards and they could turn it into a competitive advantage. So it's kind of an interesting evolution of how this relationship took 20, 30 years, but it did happen. My questions are, are different. There are two. One is that um, I sat on the board of a different company that actually um, supported a survey 
of what made a company persuasive with the public after it had had some kind of unfortunate incident. And the survey concluded that being right, correct in what you said, was far less than half the battle. What was more than half the battle was coming across as caring, mm -hmm. as being warm and fuzzy. And I'm curious to know if people on the panel agree with that. The second question is a somewhat cynical one, and that is several of you talked about what NGOs are trying to achieve when they take on a company. And you cited a bunch of things which are clearly true. There is one more, and I would ask you if that doesn't have some relevance too. And that is that these NGOs are in competition with each other to raise funds. And to the extent that they can persuade people that there is a threat which they are prepared to counteract, this will increase their fundraising capabilities. Is that too cynical or not? Well, I'll give you a comment on the first one. I'm, I'm not as familiar with the competition between them, which I would guess obviously goes on. I, I've not dealt with that. But I would definitely agree with you that uh, your willingness, what I would call to just be open, willing to listen, uh, be non-confrontative, uh, has, in my mind, an amazing impact. Uh, there were times uh, at Baxter, I won't mention specific NGOs, but there were specific times when I would get a call uh, when I was the CEO from our corporate relations folks, and they'd say, boy, such and such a group, you know, they want to meet, here's how we're going to avoid I said, wait a minute, why don't we just sit down and meet with them? Well, we, I don't think we want to do that. Well, why not? Okay, uh, as I always keep things simple, most of these are people. Okay, most of them are. Um, what I found remarkable, you'd actually sit down with folks, and most of these folks, at least the folks I dealt with, were pretty bright people. They felt really passionate about a topic, and you'd sit down and talk about it. Well, what do you think? Why do you believe that? Let me tell you what we're doing. Why is what we're doing upsetting you? Well, that makes sense. You know what? We could probably do something a little different here. Maybe, maybe there is some reasonable way to, to get better at this. Um, and I think, as somebody mentioned earlier, um, I think it may have been Joe. I think that this whole comment of there's many things you can always be doing, but if somebody actually brings it to your attention and you say, well, wait a minute. Um, Boy, if we could actually take a more serious look at the energy we're spending in some of these 60 plants around the world, we could probably save a fortune by doing that. Let's take a look at that, if you guys have got some ideas on that. And I just find when you stop being defensive and you actually are open, people really embrace that in a much better way. Whereas this view of we got to come to fighting all the time. Now, I'm, you know, I'm sure there's some groups they just want to get into a fight because they want to fight. But I, I just found just being reasonable, open, listening, you're actually taking notes, you're gonna follow up with them. 90% um, of the stuff I think you can just deal with and manage. Mm. At least that's been my experience. I, I give an example, I think it's mildly related, of a, 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 a situation of trying to site a facility and working with a community group that was vehemently opposed to the facility. And I, it was a really great process for me because we um, uh, met with them over a period of time and listened, as, and as opposed to this is what we want, this is what they want, nothing in the middle, we actually started talking about what a solution is that looks completely different from what it, it might be. Um, and it was interesting because as we presented our plan, I think your point of, you know, sure, we could give them facts and we can lay out what it was going to do. It was absolutely irrelevant, completely irrelevant. It was being at the table, talking, having a dialogue, listening, coming up with mutual concerns. I'll tell you, at the end of the day, we ended up not building the facility at all, which probably saved us millions of dollars. It was probably one of those beautiful examples of listening, talking, understanding, and it was a very well-intentioned site facility that was better off at the end of the day, um, you know, not not being built. So I do think just that dialogue was way more important than what the facts were all the way through. Well, and there's some really interesting lessons there, perhaps for Washington at the moment. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, Brayden, do you want to tackle the, the other question on the NGO competition? Is that something you've looked at? Well, I, I mean, I would just say that um, NGOs certainly do compete with each other. and. Um, 
in, and but they also they also differentiate because of this competition. So they're going to take different tactics, different strategies uh, that are, end up even though they they're caused by competition, they end up complementing each other and making uh, the other more effective. There's this thing that we talk about in political science uh, called the radical flank effect. This idea that uh, a reasonable NGO is much more effective, or a reasonable anybody is much more effective if there is a radical um, actor causing a ruckus in the background. And that's certainly true for NGOs. Ra uh, and the, the green pieces of the world are much more effective if you have a radical um, environmental uh, organization um, doing disruptive, destructive things in the background. I thought that was weak. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, no. <laughs> uh, one, yes, one like that. I'm, I'm going to pose my question to Harry. Is that, uh, at lunch, you sort of postulated that, uh, Senator mentioned that uh, corporations should not have political agendas. They should uh, convey that to their shareholders and the people should have political agendas. So we're trying to sort of separate uh, the, the heart or decision out of the corporation and let that rest with the shareholders. But Harry, you postulated that, that the corporate objective is uh, doing the right thing or the morally correct thing, uh, which sort of sounds like we're putting the emotion and ethics back in the corporation. Um, and, and it kind of ties with the question of, of are, are corporations changing because they react to external pressures over a several decade period of time or over a quite quickly period of time? Or can we get to a point where the internal compass rests with the corporation? And it, uh, I, I guess the question is how do you determine, after you postulate we're just going to do the right thing, what are the quantifiers of, make, of determining what that right thing is? Sure, and and again, I think it's I think it's a great question because a lot of this again I would say opinions, no answers. I think depends on how you think about leadership. So from my standpoint, I think if somebody is going to be an effective leader, I think they've got certain views on what makes sense. Uh, I think if they're a value-based leader, they realize, as I said earlier, when you say we're going to do the right thing, that makes us assumption what is it. So I've always been of the view, first thing that I've got to do, whether I'm in a small company or large, division, global, whatever, first thing I better do is I better have a group of, let's call it 10, 12 people uh, who I can go to, who can give me their honest view as to what they really think makes sense on any particular issue. Um, so what do you think? What do you think? What do you think? Um, and then as the leader, I will make a decision based on the best advice I can get, and I'll make a decision. That's what leadership's all about. Um, you know, I always sort of view there's, as we all know, there's a certain amount of disadvantage of being the leader, you know, some of the pressure, this or that. There's one big advantage of a leader, all right? You've got the ability to help set the agenda and set the values of the organization. Now, if you so choose not to do that, I won't make the value judgment as whether that's good or bad. I view that as one of the big advantages of being in the position, okay? Um, you know, this whole idea of, well, we'll let the, uh, we'll let the share, I wasn't at the lunch, but I'll let the shareholder decide that. That, that sounds like going back 35 years ago to, you know, we'll let the shareholder decide what they're going to do with the funds. Um, I sort of view um, within the corporation, once again, what is the corporation? I think it's mostly people, all right? Uh, and those within the organization are the leaders, I think I have a responsibility to try to do that. To your point, it isn't easy, right? That's why I always say, that's why they call it work. But based on the best input you can get, based on a leader listening, truly understanding all the different perspectives, and then making a judgment based on everything that they can, what the, does he or she think they ought to do, and to get out there and, and voice that. And by definition, some people will like it, and some people won't. Uh, one thing that one of my college professors mentioned, which I, uh, has always had an impact on me, he said, I don't, I, I don't remember the exact numbers, so I'll kind of make it up, but I think he said in the largest landslide in political history, largest landslide of election, um, somebody got 67% of the vote. And he said, think about that. In the largest landslide in history, one-third of the people truly dislike you, okay? That's the biggest landslide, right? So I've never confused leadership with being liked. Okay, and in fact, I have this little equation I use in my leadership classes that if you focus on being liked, there's a really high probability you will not be respected. But if you focus on being respected, and you listen, and you listen to people, and give, there's an actual chance you could be liked. Uh, so you know that's uh, that's just one way I, I look at it.
Daniel, you uh, just to follow up on that, I think, uh, you know, a slightly different, related, but slightly, perhaps slightly different perspective on that. So I spend a lot of time in like meetings with like, uh, you know, when, when, when I'm not doing research and teaching, I also work with companies. And yeah, so I, I you know, you're, you're in the meetings when like, uh, when they have these issues, when they have these difficulties, and when like an NGO is kind of knocking at the door, and it looks, it's a tough, it's tough then. And I think those are the kind of the crucibles of leadership where you really have to kind of make those decisions. But sometimes you hear the following argument. No, 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 we can't do that. We cannot do that. We cannot like a change, for example, the structure of a plan or improve the labor conditions or this and this because we have a fiduciary responsibility to our shareholders. <laughs> I hear that. Right, I mean, and, and my answer at this point is you have a fiduciary responsibility not to be stupid, right? That's the, <laughs> that's the answer, right? I mean, this is like, a, what is that, right? Your fiduciary responsibility as a leader is to do, right, is very, in this particular case, very often along the lines of what, what Harry is talking about. And this, this idea is that we can just kind of check ourselves out from like the expectations and and views and values that that we have in every day is just bizarre to me and it's it's not it's not because there's we have a big philosophical debate here that's a good one to have by the way and i think we're going to have it over those two days but just the reality is that if you're out of touch with what it is that your people your supplier your customers right value we would never do that in any other aspect. So I think that's some kind of a phony argument that people are just confused about what their job is and how they have to manage the different constraints and uh, responsibilities that are put upon them. Mm. Well, I, <laughs> I think we're probably out of time, so um, I'm going to wrap up on that note. But thank you so much, uh, panel. That was just a great discussion. <laughs> for being so great participating. Sure.